Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing. On today's special episode, our panel of guest speakers will be discussing passive management and the case for index ETFs. Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing, a special edition of ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen, VP of Online Distribution with BMO ETFs. A quick reminder, today we are not providing you investment advice or investment recommendations. Our channel is all about providing education around investing and around ETFs focused on the Canadian do-it-yourself investor. I'm going to turn it over to Sejal Patel shortly. Sejal is the creator and host of Strictly Money, Canada's only national personal finance program. She's a former business anchor and correspondent for CNBC and BNN and is a CFA charter holder. Sejal is also the founder of Sage Wealth Consulting and is passionate about helping women create financial independence through education. Sejal, take it away. Welcome to ETF Market Insights. I'm Sejal Patel. In this episode, we will look at the rise of index-based investing or passive investing and the important role it's playing in helping investors like you build wealth across cost-effective market access. I'm pleased to be joined by Greg Walker, Director of ETF Capital Markets with BMO. Greg has a wealth of experience in the ETF space and works closely with the capital markets teams to build new partnerships and create innovative products for investors. We also have Graham McKenzie. Graham is Managing Director of ETFs at the TMX. And Graham is also a former equity trader with more than 20 years of experience in the industry. Welcome, gentlemen. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. I'm looking forward to this discussion, so let's dive in. Greg, let's kick things off. What is the difference between passive and active investing? Uh, that's a good question. So I like to think of it on a spectrum. So on one side, you have passive investing, which people in that, in that end of, of the investing strategies tend to believe that it's very, very hard to beat the market, that um, it's, it's better to get exposure to the market, hold it for longer periods of time, and kind of minimize your trading to reduce costs. On the other end of the spectrum, you have active managers or, or people uh, employing active strategies, and they're kind of the opposite, if, as, you, as you might imagine. They think there are opportunities to outperform the market, that their holding periods might be a little more tactical, meaning their shorter holding periods, a little more trading, and they think they, they can carve out a little bit extra return off the, uh, off, the, off the market. In reality, most investors aren't on one or the other end. They're blending those strategies together in their portfolios. Uh, in certain areas, they might be passive. In certain areas, they might be active. Graham, index investing or ETF investing has grown exponentially over the last decade. What's behind the growth? Well, I think, as you said, it's grown exponentially over the last decade. And for example, we've seen assets under management from an ETF perspective grow from about $60 billion 10 years ago to about $350 billion here in Canada. Funds have gone from about 250 to over 1,000 ETFs. So there's obviously been that growth that's happened. Why? Well, one thing is, is people are looking for what ETFs can deliver particularly when, when we're talking about it from an index perspective or a passive perspective. And the fact that they can deliver um, the advantage of being low cost, they provide the diversification that many investors are really looking for. So that's, in a nutshell, that's really some of the biggest reasons why we've seen this, as you said, exponential growth in ETFs and passive investing. Okay. Greg, let's talk about the SPIVA report. And uh, SPIVA stands for S&P Indices Versus Active. These reports have been available for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, explain what it entails and why it could benefit investors. Yeah, they're, they're a very powerful free source of, of information. And really about, well, I think it was 2002, they first started uh, this, this body of research. And it was S&P Global that um, decided to, to go down this path. And it came from uh, a need or, or at least an identified need where investors were trying to figure out when to go active, when to go passive, when to use indexes, when to you know, hire an active manager. And, but it, it's hard to do. You, you, there's a lot of research there and it's hard to know where to pick the, your spots. Um, so they created this body of research that is both by region and asset class that compares apples to apples 
active managers uh, performance over I think it's one three five and maybe even ten at this point year year holding periods versus if you had used the index itself and they just go through uh, systematically and, and unbiased uh, in their approach uh, when when what it looks like in certain regimes uh, for the active managers. So it's a very, very, very powerful uh, body of research. Graham, based on the latest SPIVA report, and let's look at the Canadian funds and the most recent performance results, what is the research telling you about active versus passive performance? Well, you know, the last SPIVA report that looks at 2022 is really kind of interesting. And, and what happened in the marketplace also really explains it. If you look back at the end of 2021 and the start of 2022, the largest company in the S&P TSX composite in the S&P TSX 60 was Shopify. Shopify was down 73% in 2022. And if you're an active manager and you're underweight, you're going to outperform. So what does that mean from a, you know, a data perspective or in the SPIVA report? Only 37% of active managers beat that are focused on Canadian equities beat the benchmark. So it really tells you what, what's happening out there from an active perspective when you have potentially something that could really drive your performance to that degree. When you go back even further and take a look at how the performance was for Canadian focused um, funds, um, when you look at three years back, it was only 29% beat the benchmark. You go back five years, it's 8%. And then you even go back 10 years, as Greg was alluding, these reports can look that far back, 10 years, only 4% of active fund managers beat the benchmarks. So that's Canada. Uh, Greg, I'll ask you this question. Are there geographic regions where active management is beating passive management? There are, there, there definitely are. So, and, and I think that again, the reports do a very nice job. The one area that kind of stuck out to me for 2022 was global active equity uh, managers. Um, so similar stats in a sense that in 2022, 46% of the managers for that year beat the indexes. You know, that doesn't seem like a lot, that's less than 50%. Sure, if you had one of those active managers, you're, you're, you're pretty happy that you, you have them. Um, but what's interesting about that time period is actually if you if you go out that three years that Graham mentioned, the uh, the the amount of uh, active managers that bought, uh, beat the index were was only seven percent. Put another way, ninety three percent of the managers did not beat the index. So it's an interesting thing because it's not just looking at regions, but also time frames, right? So. Well, it's 46 doesn't sound like a lot for active managers to beat the index. It's actually multiple times the, the runway, three, five years kind of thing. And there was a sim similar reasons. They were, they, there was a lot of stress in the market. There was uh, inflation shocks. There was geopolitical uh, things starting to, to pop up. And there was an opportunity to um, kind of look at that part of the portfolio and maybe apply some active uh, management to it. Um, looking out for their periods, it, it reverts back, you know, three, five, 10 years, it reverts back to very hard to outperform the index. So what I say is it's, 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 there are opportunities to blend active and passive. The tough part of it is how do you know where you are in time? Are you about to enter an area where an active manager can outperform a global uh, uh, active equity? Or are you behind that time? So I think that's where we see a lot of flows go into index and passive because you can hold it over longer period, periods of time. You don't necessarily have the time when these events happen, but there is room for active. If you're very, very good at timing it, then there are opportunities out there in certain regions to, to outperform. It's just knowing where, what point in time you're, you're at. Graham, of the active managers that do manage to outperform, how many actually do it consistently? Because I think this is what investors, a lot of investors want to know. You know, that's a really good question. And you know what, S&P does actually dig a little further further into the data and they, they actually publish a report called uh, the persistent report as part of uh, the SPIVA reports. Um, the one for 2022 will come out probably sometime later this spring, but if we look back, because we can look back and see how the data looks. And so if we look back at the last report and you look at the fund managers that were in the top quartile of performance, 
though not one single one of them two years later was in the top quartile. So if you're in, one, in the top quartile one year and you stretch it back two years, they didn't actually find any of those same fund managers in that same top quartile two years out. Greg Spiva focuses on equities, but there really isn't an equivalent for the fixed income space. So can you shed some light when it comes to active versus passive in the bond market or fixed income market? In other words, when does it make sense for an investor to use active managers? Uh, it's a very good question. Actually, not in Canada, but in the US and UK, Spiva does have a fixed income report. And I only mention that because it can be used as a proxy a little bit for for Canadian uh, investors to try to get a sense of, of where to do, uh, where to apply active and where to apply index investing. Um, that said, we don't have that in Canada. So it is, it's an interesting question because it really comes down to what are the investors needs. And a lot of investors look at their fixed income part of their portfolio as almost like one allocation, right? If you're looking at a pie chart, it'd be a solid wedge. Here's my fixed income allocation. But because ETFs have been around, fixed income ETFs have been around for over 20 years now, you really do have the ability to be as thoughtful and as surgical in your fixed income part of your portfolio as you are in your equity, equity part of your portfolio. So as a, as a general example, I mean, you, you could come in and get a very clean, efficient, um, diversified allocation to broad uh, Canadian fixed income. You, you get Canadian firms diversified across regions, you'd get government, and you'd have diversification across maturity dates and, and uh, coupons. That's, that's totally fine. If, if an investor wants to look at that part of the portfolio and say, actually, in my fixed income part, I want to drive a little bit more uh, return or I want to um, have a higher yield there, you can start to carve it up a little bit and say, well, maybe in credit, I know a good credit manager, I'm going to apply uh, that manager to that, you know, the credit sleeve of my fixed income portfolio. Maybe I want exposure to discount bonds. Right? So I can buy an index wedge of the portfolio and get exposure to discount bonds in the portfolio. So you get the sense that you can actually, you can actually be quite thoughtful about your fixed income side of it because of the, the tool of an ETF. It sounds like there's a role for both. So Graham, let me ask you, how can investors combine both active and passive investing? How, how would that work? Well, one of the most common maybe not the most common, but one of the tactics or maybe one of the approaches that many advisors use and, and investors use is this uh, approach called the core and satellite. And so what that is, is you build your core of your portfolio, the bulk of your portfolio, utilizing low cost, broad uh, market indice products and ETFs to build you know, that core, as I said. And then you start to utilize satellite investments to either manage risk through diversification or take a tactical approach and add potentially um, different satellites that would provide you with an opportunity to outperform the market. And that's where the active uh, component comes in. Because if you take, um, take a look at what, what a passive fund is, or an index fund is, it's trying to return or give you the return of the market or the benchmark. Where an active portfolio manager is really going out and trying to beat the market. So utilizing the satellite where you, uh, either using a few different funds to enhance your performance with an active manager, just the same way as you might do that uh, in ways of looking to add income or risk management tools of diversification. So that's that's probably, you know, one of the common approaches that's utilized where you combine both passive index managed products with active. Greg, at BMO, what are the main index ETFs that cover the broad market indexes? It's an excellent question, and, it, and it, sometimes it gets harder to, to figure out what ETFs to use because there are so many out there now. A very powerful resource is bmoetfs.com. You can go there, you can sort through you know, the many, many ETFs and you can really drill down into fixed income or drill down into equity. But on the, uh, off the top of it, some very, very useful and, and some of our biggest fund uh, ETFs are ZCN, which is broad exposure to Canadian equity. 
um, ZEA, which is broad exposure to international equity, ZSP, which is actually, if not the biggest, one of the biggest ETFs in Canada, uh, which is based off and tracking the S&P 500. And then on the fixed income side of things, ZAG is the Canadian broad exposure that we talked a little bit about in terms of a, a very broad index uh, exposure to, to Canadian fixed income. And then there's ZUAG, which is the US version of that. So a diversified portfolio of, of US corporates and governments. And remind me, uh, just because two ETFs cover the same market index doesn't mean that they're created equal, right? No, it's it's absolutely true. And, and as there's more and more uh, funds out there, uh, it is important to take a look. Uh, just because they have the index in the name uh, doesn't mean they're exactly the same. Um, the nice thing about ETFs in general is that they are highly transparent. So you can, and I would suggest you would, like if you're looking at two exposures from two different providers, take a look at their history, take a look at their uh, reputation in the space, and then take a look under the hood of the fund because the information's on, on most providers' uh, website. They, they give you the whole look through into what the fund's holding and what it's tracking. For investors who are looking for international exposure, when they're looking at international ETFs, why is it important that the ETF actually has direct holding of the securities? It's, uh, and it's a good reason to look under the hood. It doesn't take a lot of time. You, you can go to a website and check. But if an ETF is not holding the underlying and it's an international, simply put, you might be double taxed. Uh, double withholding tax is what's happening there. So if you, if you wrap a, a US listed uh, ETF that then holds underlying international, you're paying the US fund pays withholding tax and then you're buying. And the, the distribution you get from the US to Canada, you pay it again. So what do you do about that? Just simply look at the holdings. And if the holdings are owning directly the international, you are paying withholding tax, but it's only once. And that's, that would happen even if you held it outside an ETF. If you, if you hold international securities, there's one level. If it's wrapping, you might be paying tax twice for, for no real value. And would it actually say that? It'll say it in the sense that if you look underneath, it'll, it'll hold the, show the holdings. And then you can just tell. It'll, if it's holding another ETF, it'll show that it's holding another ETF. Graham, one of the biggest challenges I hear from investors is they don't know how to create an actual portfolio using ETFs. And we know that asset allocation is one of the most important determinants when it comes to success, performance success, and meeting someone's goals. Good news is there are things called asset allocation ETFs. So can you explain what those are and how they work? Yeah, for sure. The, you're, you're absolutely right. The, this is something that really helps a lot of investors. And these are your all-in-one solutions. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as portfolio ETFs. Sometimes they might be referred to as balance funds and such. And what these are, is, as I said, is all-in-one solutions where you essentially get an asset allocation based on either your risk tolerances, your stage of, of, of your life, um, and what they are is a professionally managed ETF in the sense that the asset allocation is taken care of you, for you, as well as the rebalancing. You get the advantage of broad-based index funds coupled across or essentially laid out across different asset classes. And one of the challenges that, that I think you've not only figuring out what the asset allocation is, but one of the challenges that comes is how often do you rebalance and return your portfolio to your target um, allocation or the optimum sort of portfolio allocation. And what these funds can really do for you at a low cost is provide you that rebalancing so that it will stay on target for what the outcome or the risk performance that you're looking for. Greg, Graham, thank you for your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Index-based ETFs offer tremendous value to investors, which is clear from our discussion today. These are low-cost, well-diversified, and the SPIVA data is definitely insightful in terms of performance benefits as well. I also enjoy the discussion around how investors can look to combine both active and passive by adopting a core satellite approach to their investments. Now that covers off our session. I wanna thank BMO ETFs for continuing to host these educational segments for do-it-yourself investors and helping them become more informed. Have a great day.